Acts chapter 6, beginning with verse number 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples, mind you, it was already about 10,000, The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Well, last week we introduced this passage and introduced our intention to see in this passage a three bewares and three beholds. We began with just the first beware last week, and that was letter A, beware of the danger of denouncing. And we saw from the Greek word translated complaint or murmur last week that denouncing uh, what amounts to not discussing or informing or assuming the best about people until all the facts are gathered, but rather what's going on here is a straight up public accusation of wrongdoing in a spirit of whining and grumbling and even begrudging. It's an operation according to the flesh rather than according to the spirit. And we must beware of going there because we saw in no uncertain terms from Scripture last week that there is no place for that in the life of a Christian in any context much less the context of the church. No place for complaining the way it's being done in verse 1. That was last week. Now we proceed to our next beware. Letter B. Beware of the division of disciples. Incredibly, by God's providence, in Sunday school this morning, we talked a lot about unity in the church We were reminded last week that all Christians are absolutely expected by the Holy Spirit to be, and by the Bible, all Christians are assumed to be disciples. Disciples of Christ Jesus, disciples being those who follow Jesus while learning from Jesus and then applying what they are learning from Jesus to their following of Jesus. That's a disciple. So according to the Bible, according to the Bible, if I'm not a disciple of Jesus, I'm not a Christian. And being a disciple of Jesus means, among other things, that what's important to Jesus becomes increasingly, progressively more and more important to me. And one thing that's very important to Jesus is the unity of his disciples. We saw that from John 17 in Sunday school this morning. One very important thing to Jesus is the unity of his disciples and the abolishing of division among his disciples. In verse 1. We see a clear division of the disciples. And this division, as we saw last week, is along cultural and linguistic lines. 
Last week we learned that first century Hellenist Jews and Hebrew Jews are frankly very different from one another in fundamental ways. And brothers and sisters, it's fine to acknowledge that. It, it, it seems to me like today that if we suggest that people from uh, various places and people who were raised very differently from one another, uh, people who not only um, come from but also continue to exist in dramatically different cultural contexts, it seems like if we dare suggest that people are fundamentally different from one another that were branded a racist or a supremacist or a hater or whatever. But look at creatures in the sea. They are dramatically, fundamentally different from one another. Look at creatures on the land. There is remarkable diversity. And the same beautiful thing is true of human beings. Our creator is an incredible artist and he has used all kinds of wonderful uh, colors and cultures and creative conditions to reveal and manifest his manifold glory. And far from denying that, we should celebrate that and praise him for it even in this little sanctuary this morning. There are people who are dramatically dramatically different from one another in temperament and tendencies and talents and thought processes, many different interests, many different ways of living and loving and working and worshiping, many different, even in this little room, many different kinds of backgrounds and backstories, all this kind of stuff which normally divides people just makes the kingdom of God more beautiful. And around that throne of glory in heaven, says Revelation 5, 9, are people, you know this, people from every tribe, and tongue, and people, and nation, all singing to Jesus together. What divides the world must never divide disciples. What divides the world must never divide disciples of Jesus because unity in diversity brings much glory to God. And so we must always, always beware of the division of disciples. And be working, working not to make everyone the same. How stinking horrible would that be? Not working to, to make people conform to something and be the same. But, but, but no, working. Think about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're not the same. And yet they are what, Sunday schoolers? One. One. And so we must be working, Ephesians 4, 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Not just being for it, and, and hoping for it, but actually endeavoring to keep it, laboring for it, laboring for unity. The Jerusalem church in our text, as I mentioned, they are coming to understand that we are 10,000 people strong. There's going to be some dramatic differences, right? In 10,000 people. And if we don't work hard for unity... Our bond of peace is in danger of being broken. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's Ephesians 4, 3. And then in Ephesians 4, 13, the thought is continued. We work for this. We fight for this. Unity. We, we work for it. We fight for it. We strive for it. We sacrifice for it. For it till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Praise the Lord. I want us to hear and be impressed with how 
important this is to God. All right? Just listen to some Bible on this. Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and what? Avoid them. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are abomination to him. Proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. Those are some very, very serious things. And then look what God adds to that as comparable to all that kind of stuff. And one who sows discord among brethren. God hates it. He lumps it in with pride and lying and murder. He hates it. Abomination. Such people are disgusting to God. People who cause division amongst his people are disgusting to him. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3 says, you're still carnal. I'm not speaking to you, Paul. Speaking to the Corinthian church says, you're still carnal. carnal. You're still in the flesh. And here's how I know. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. That's how I know that you are carnal. And that you're behaving like mere men, not like the man, Christ Jesus, who you claim to be following and from whom you claim to be learning. I just want to see how important this is to God. It's all we're doing, this deal of unity. 1 Corinthians 1.10, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He goes on to ask there, is Christ divided? If not, then disciples of Christ can't be either. In Sunday school this morning, we saw God is one. He is never divided. Therefore, says Mark 10, 9, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And, and, and we're not even studying today Psalm 133, which is all about this truth expressed in that first verse of how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I say to you this morning, brethren, as we go into a new year, beware of anything that might cause division amongst disciples. Amen? Let her see. Beware of distraction, and then in parentheses, dereliction from duty. Beware of distraction leading to dereliction of duty. Verse 2, Acts 6 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Let's talk about the statement. First, the Greek word translated desirable here in my New King James translation also gets translated um, agreeable, fitting, or sometimes just right. So the apostle is saying it's, just, it's not right that we, which, which makes it what? Wrong, right? Wrong, right. Wrong. Uh, so they're saying it's, it's wrong that we would leave the word of God. It's, it's not agreeable. It's not fitting. And listen carefully. They certainly do not mean that they are above the work of the daily distribution of food to the needy. Because as we saw last week, up to this very moment, the apostles indeed have been doing that work. Even as they speak here, they are doing that work. So it's important to note the statement in verse 2 does not say that it's not desirable, not fitting, not right for us to serve tables. Not at all. They're saying that it's not desirable or fitting or right for us to leave the word of God to do so. All right. Now, let's look at the words serve tables. 
What's this really mean? Two words here. We have to make sure we understand both of them. The Greek word serve is diakonio. I just had to pause to get the translation in my brain. Diakoneo. Ao. There it is. Diakoneo. It's, of course, where we get our English word what? Anybody recognize it? Deacon. All right. And it, and it means to attend to or to serve. Now, as a guy who loves etymology, I am uh, fascinated to learn that the word, this just fascinates me to know in. You know what etymology? That's not a word we use all the time. Isn't that just study of bugs? No. Um, study of word origins, uh, also known as nerdology, uh, but that's, that's how it is. Uh, this word originally... The, the word translated deacon uh, or minister originally referred to dust, to dust. And it came to refer to those who kick up dust because of how quickly they're going to serve people. That's the origin of this word. That, that's, so that's the first word, serve or deacon. Now, for the second word, tables, really important. In first century Greek usage, this word refers to a table or a counter, and it was used simply to describe, to refer to everyday activity, everyday needs. All right, I can demonstrate this. I remember almost 30, whew, almost 30 years ago now when I was in uh, sales training to sell insurance. My, my trainer taught me, now when you get into someone's home, remember this was 30 years ago, Times are a little different. When you get into someone's home, they're, they're going to naturally invite you to sit on a, on a chair, on a couch. And when they do, Thomas, what do you say? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I taught you this. I know you are. So am I. When they do, you instead smile and say, Thank you so much. Would it be okay if we just sat at the kitchen table and then start walking toward the table? All right? Now, why, why do we do that? Because in our culture 30 years ago, at least, the kitchen table is not only where you eat, but it's also where you spread out bills and do what? Do the very thing that I want you to do here in about 30 minutes. Not here, but what I'm selling insurance. So that's what people are used to, spreading out bills, writing checks. Uh, and, and, and again, we're going 30 years, and we were mostly in the rural culture. That's where husbands and wives met at the kitchen table over coffee to make life plans and where the family would sit at supper time to talk about everything. And me, a salesman, wants to be, wants to be thought of as part of the family. And right, so can we just go to the... So, so this Greek word for table can refer simply to daily activity, daily needs, daily operations. All right? So the apostles are saying in verse 2, it's not the right thing for us to be kicking up dust, going from house to house, to make sure that the daily needs of the members of the church are met. Why? Because it's, our God-given duty to deacon, to attend to, to serve by not leaving our study of the Word of God. Our preparation, and we'll see uh, next week, I think, our prayerful preparation to teach and preach the Bible. To deacon the Bible. To serve the people that way. That's, the apostles are saying that's our God-given duty. And there's simply not enough hours in their day and not enough energy in the body and mind to do that and kick up dust doing other stuff too. Matthew Henry says, th this is so insightful. Though they had, though they, the original apostles, though they had not such occasion to study for what they preached as we have, because they are uniquely gifted as apostles, yet they thought that was work enough for a whole man. 
and to employ all their thoughts and cares and time. Though one man of them was more than 10 of us, more than 10,000, they will no more be drawn from their preaching by the money laid at their feet than they will be driven from it by the stripes laid on their backs. To prayerfully prepare to teach and preach was their full-time keyword duty and to try to do other stuff was a, another keyword distraction from that duty. 2 Timothy 2.4 No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please who? Him who enlisted him as a soldier. No such person can please everyone. And by trying to do that won't be pleasing the most important one. Beware of distraction from duty unto dereliction of duty. And this statement in no way demeans the serving of tables, the serving of the everyday needs of the people. That was an incredibly important thing that brought much glory to God. When the world saw the church doing that, they just could not do it and still do their divine duty. Now, from whom, from whom did they learn this? Their disciples. So who, who, from whom did they learn it? Jesus, remember? Disciples are followers of Jesus who are learning from Jesus and applying what they are learning from Jesus to their following of Jesus. And Jesus was once asked in their hearing to serve, to deacon as an arbitrator in the everyday affairs of his people. And he said, Luke 12, 13 and 14, he said, that's not my duty. I won't be distracted from my duty. The disciples called to be apostles learned what they're expressing here in verse 2. They learned it from Jesus. How many of y'all know it's hard to say no? It is hard, it is hard to say no because of a whole, uh, I was going to say cocktail, but I can't say that from a Baptist pulpit, from a whole recipe of, of reasons. It's hard to say no. Right? Because of good intentions, uh, because of a desire to help, or sometimes it's even because of pride and the desire to be uh, um, a, a microcontroller of everything. Sometimes it's just from a desire to be men pleasers, but either because of good reasons or not so good reasons, it's hard not to say yes to good stuff. And many a pastor has actually been celebrated by his church for never saying no and for being a visiting and calling machine and every meeting attendee and a 60 hours per week servant of the people who is available 24-7 and many a pastor has burnt right out or lost relationship with his wife and children and come close to losing his mind and health in the process and the apostles 2,000 years ago said don't do that, it's not right it's wrong so it's not the right thing to do, even though it garners much applause, even from the church. It's not right before God. It's dereliction of duty by distraction. Question, question. What is your divine duty? What is your divine duty? To what ministry, to what deaconship have you been called? How are you to serve? How are you to deacon? In the context of family, in the context of community, in the context of church, how is it that you, Christian disciple of Jesus, how are you called to deacon? How are you called? In what way are you called to be kicking up dust? 
anxious to serve? I cannot answer that for you. Uh, No one can except God, the Holy Spirit. And he does that several different ways, including, but not limited to, gifting you with certain abilities and interests. Gifting you with certain abilities and interests. I cannot do what Thomas stood up here and did with that thing in his hands. I don't care how many lessons, I I guarantee you, I don't care how many lessons I would take. I would not be able to do that. It's just not in me to do it. He has been gifted that way. And he then has to wrestle with, okay, what is the Lord calling me to do? To what divine duty am I called by being gifted in that way? Does that make sense? So gifting you with certain abilities and interests And also, the Holy Spirit does this by burdening you with certain cares and concerns. If you are burdened with certain cares and concerns, the Holy Spirit may be calling you to some divine duty regarding those cares and those concerns. And the Holy Spirit does this by calling you through requests from His people, the church. But whatever your duty is, brother or sister, find it, do it, and don't get distracted by everything else in the world that needs done. Everything else in this world, which would be great to do. Beware of the distraction from and dereliction of your divine duty. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, God the Holy Spirit through the apostle tells Pastor Timothy, fulfill Eric Elkin's ministry. Is that what it says? Is it up there? Does it, say, does it say, fulfill Matt Hill's ministry? What's it say? What's, Pastor, what's, what's, what's the apostle say to Pastor Timothy? That's clear, isn't it? Do what you've been gifted to do. Do what you've been burdened to do. Do what God has given you to do. And don't be distracted from it by what Eric and Matt have to do. And don't be distracted from it with really awesome things that someone else needs to do. And and that verse uses, by the way, the exact same word used here in Acts 6.2. It's, look at this, is it still up there? It's fulfill your deaconship. Same, same Greek word. Same Greek word. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, the Apostle Paul says, He knows that he has been sent to preach and he doesn't even want to be distracted by as good of a thing as baptizing people from that duty of preaching. Baptizing people is a great thing to do. It doesn't demean it. It doesn't demean serving tables. It just means you find what God has given you to do and dig in and don't be distracted by desire to please everyone or pride, or even golden intentions to try to do it all. Praise the Lord. What a relief. We all have a duty or duties in the kingdom of God. We must find it. If we need help finding it, we must ask for that help. But if we're disciples of Jesus, we must find it and dang well do it and not be distracted from it unto dereliction of it. Okay? One last thing I want you to notice from verse 2 before we close. In verse 1, the apostles have been the subject of complaining, the subject of denouncing. But please notice, they don't complain back. They don't get, as far as we can tell, they don't get defensive. They, they don't say, do you think you could do any better, pal? Right? I remember when, uh, when Adrian was in a softball league up in Castleton, uh, all the umpires, every game, 
were, were parents drawn from the, from the crowd that day. And, and pretty much anytime someone complained, which was really, it was really rare, but pretty much anytime someone complained, the ump, who is some kid's dad, would take the mask off and say, just hand, just hand the mask. Say, here you go, pal. Uh, no problem. I don't mind you not liking how I do it. I'm, I'm positive you're going to do it better. The disciples didn't do that. They learned that from Jesus too. And they're following him. They're following the one who says 1 Peter 2.23, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. The apostle Paul will later write that which is recorded as 1 Corinthians 4.12, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. So verse 2 says, the apostles summon that it might be, it might be this. We know this was a Baptist church. We know this was a Baptist church, right? They summon, they they summon everybody to what might be the first business meeting in church history. They summon the church together to deal with what could have been brought up in a better way. But hey, it's been brought up now, so they summon the church as far as we can tell immediately to deal with the situation. Now that's key. Here's why. They imme- don't miss this. They immediately begin the pursuit, Romans 14, 19 style. They immediately begin the pursuit of the things which make for peace and the things which edify which build up the church. They're not interested in threatening to quit. They're not interested in joining a different church or withholding their offering because people are upset about how they're handling things. They don't get passively aggressive and make vague comments on social media, inviting others to say, what's wrong? No. They are disciples of Jesus. They follow Jesus. They learn from Jesus. They apply what they learn from Jesus to following Jesus. We'd be wise to do the same. What do you think? So that's our three bewares from this passage of the word of God. Beware of the danger of denouncing. Beware of the division of disciples. Beware of distraction from your duty leading to dereliction of the same. Having studied these three bewares, if the Lord allows, we'll push on next week to study from this passage, three beholds. Until then, let's follow Jesus and learn from Jesus and apply what we are learning from Jesus to our following of Jesus. Fair enough, disciples? Would you stand?